thank you everybody for being here today. Um, I think I think this is not exactly introduction to Sanskrit yet. I think I'm talking about why you should study Sanskrit um, or why I think you should study Sanskrit, in which case um, I hope to convince you to take my course, which is an introduction to Sanskrit, which is starting um, next month. I think it's September 22nd, a Sunday, and it's going to be once a month for nine months. So um, I hope to convince you that that's a good idea. Um, so, oops, I think we have some people on there. Yes. Um, well done. I'm just going to make sure that my slides will work. I'm a little bit new to um, the technology. Did that work? It looks good. OK, great. It just says, why study Sanskrit? <laughs> I think that's what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, so I thought I would start by telling you um, why I study Sanskrit um, and why I started studying Sanskrit and why I continue to study Sanskrit. Um, I started studying about almost 20 years ago um, on my, during my first trip to India. Um, I was 20 and I was fortunate enough to um, have started practicing yoga when I was 15. And I went to India when I was 20 and um, I had heard my teacher speaking in Sanskrit and um, was intrigued. And I'd always been intrigued by language. Um, I'd been, was studying Japanese at the time for no real reason other than that I thought it was fun. Um, but then I heard him speak Sanskrit and I was in India and my roommate um, happened to have a teacher who would come to our house and give Sanskrit lessons. Um, so I was lucky enough to um, get to join get to join them and he would come and he would bring his harmonium every time and he would play the harmonium. And I can't remember if he would sing the alphabet or he would sing the words, but it was very, I found it very intriguing. And I studied for a few months in India and I'd walk around Mysore sort of singing the alphabet and um, singing the different sounds and words and chants. Um, and then I came home and I bought myself a book and I'm a very diligent person. So I did it about an hour a day for six months. And then I kind of ran out of steam and I felt like I needed a teacher and I didn't have one. So I quit for a while. And then I went back to India um, and I started studying again and I started studying again for a few months. And then I went home and I bought a book and I did it again for six months. And I kind of got to a certain point and I didn't have a teacher and I quit. And, then I went back to India and this went on for a few years. Um, and then I ended up going back to school at Columbia and I think I was going to study neuroscience actually, um, but I ended up taking a Sanskrit class and fell in love with it um, and was there for quite a few years. Um, and then I took a break um, and I, um, I wrote my book um, which if you do take the course, um, we will be learning from my book. It's a very big, heavy thing. Um, I didn't know that when I was writing it, but I wrote it because I think there's, um, the Indian method and the Western method are quite different. And I think there's a lot of benefits to both. Um, and I brought, I wrote the book to sort of try to bring together these different, these two different methods. Um, and I guess for me, um, I study Sanskrit because I want to read these texts and I want to know for myself what they mean. Um, I was listening to a talk recently actually in which somebody was sort of giving the reasons why you shouldn't learn Sanskrit. Um, and I think his main reason was basically that it's hard. Um, and it is hard, but I think it's also worth it and it's rewarding. And I don't think it's as hard as people make it out to be. 
So, um, you know, I think it takes consistent effort. Um, I was looking at Tara's tattoo, which she was going to model for us, but it's, <laughs> it's, um, says, um, so in that, um, in that sutra, it says from the Yoga Sutra, um, I believe it's number 14, chapter one, number 14, um, that that Satyadhyaga Kala, so that practice which is done, that's referring to yoga, but I think it applies to Sanskrit study as well. So that if you practice for Dhirga Kala a long time, Nairantarya, without interruption, Satkara Sevita, with devotion, this establishes firm ground. And I think it's the same thing for Sanskrit study. So if you do 10 or 15 minutes a day, that's going to be a lot more rewarding than to do an hour or so once a week. And that's where you build Sanskrit practice. Um, so I'm gonna give you a few other reasons why I think that it's a good idea to study Sanskrit. Um, and while I'm talking, um, if you have questions, please type them. I, I'm used to teaching a room full of people um, where people interact and ask questions and I like questions. Um, so please, anything that you have, if you type it, I will do my best to read it and answer it um, as it comes up. Um, so, um, let me see if I can make my slides work. Um, Um, I can't seem to make my slides go to the next slide. Sorry, I am new to the technology. Um, okay. Oh, there it is. There you go. Yep. So here are just some reasons that, um, I think would be a good idea to study Sanskrit. Um, the first one being obviously, to be able to read texts. Um, and I guess, you know, this would be, you obviously won't necessarily all be able to read and translate fully, and that may not be your goal. But I do think it's a good idea to be able to um, to at least look at a text and look at a translation and have some relationship to it. Um, particularly if you are a yoga practitioner, if you have some interest in India and Sanskrit for whatever reason, um, that, um, yeah, it's, I would say the main reason would be because you want to be able to read texts. And even if you don't get to the point of being flu fluently able to read texts, um, the next best reason I would say is to be able to understand the choices that translators make. So often we'll read something in translation and you don't necessarily know that, um, you know, that the translator is making a choice. Um, Particularly if you're, particularly if you're reading um, a text in translation that doesn't have the Sanskrit side by side, you know, you might sort of just take it as this is what the text says. Um, I often see people post things on Facebook or whatever saying, you know, the Bhagavad Gita says, and then there's a quote in English and you know, the Bhagavad Gita didn't actually say that this is somebody's interpretation of the text. So I would say that the best thing, you know, the second best reason is even if you can't translate texts yourself is um, to be able to understand the choices that, um, that a translator is making and to understand, as I said, the fact that they actually are making choices. And um, we're going to look in a bit at some, at a few verses um, and the different, just a few different translations so that you can see how this, um, the different choices that, that um, a translator might make. Um, 
And each word has a lot of different potential meanings. So um, we'll look a bit at that later too. Um, and then of course, if you are a yoga teacher or a yoga student, or um, again, in some other way, interacting with Indian culture, um, it's good to be able to pronounce words correctly. Um, for example, even just asana, right? I hear people a lot of times saying asana rather than asana. Um, whereas if you can read the actual letters and the words, you'll understand why there's a long sound at the beginning and why there's a shorter sound um, in the middle. So another reason to study Sanskrit is that it's good for your brain. Um, there was an article recently, maybe you've read it, um, about the Sanskrit effect um, written by or based on some research by a neuroscientist who's researching the effects of um, of chanting and of sound on the brain. Um, and so it is thought that this sort of repetitive, um, repetitive chanting, repetitive sound um, is, can be good for things like Alzheimer's. Um, it can help to build concentration and focus. Um, and it can also help to calm your mind. I've been sort of taking a survey of um, my Sanskrit students this week and um, definitely I think the consensus seems to be that it it makes them feel good it makes them it helps their concentration it helps their um, it helps them to sort of oops sorry I didn't mean to do that yet um, it helps them to sort of focus and yeah to kind of calm their mind in a different way um, a lot of people like to do it first thing in the morning. Some people like to do it before they go to bed. Um, but that it, it actually takes a great amount of focus to be able to hear the sounds, pronounce the sounds, see the letters, read the letters, write the letters. Um, and of course, um, just some side benefits. You can read signs in India because a lot of them are written in Hindi, which has the same alphabet as Sanskrit, um, you can make sure that your tattoo is spelled correctly. You can look at other people's. I've, um, you, there are a lot of people walking around with ta Sanskrit tattoos that are spelled incorrectly. And you will know that if you read Sanskrit. People sometimes email me and ask me um, how to spell their tattoo. Um, it's better if somebody does that before they get it, obviously. Um, but yes, those are just some reasons. I think, you know, even more fundamental than that um, is, I would say, the effect that it has on your brain. So, um, and the vibration, the sounds, um, sort of they're all, each sound is articulated in a different place in the mouth. We're gonna look a little bit at the alphabet today, but we'll look at it more, um, We'll look at it more in the introduction to Sanskrit class. Um, but generally speaking, each sound is articulated in a different place in the mouth. And this has an effect on your nervous system, on your brain, um, which we will see. We're going to do a little chanting in a minute. Um, so this picture is a yantra. Um, we'll talk about what that means in a few minutes, but this is a yantra to Ganesha. Ganesha, who is the elephant-headed god who you see there in the middle, um, who is the remover of obstacles. Um, and you'll see around him, he has, um, he's in the middle of a four-petaled lotus, which have little, sim um, little Sanskrit syllables, vum at the top, and then some on the left and shum on the right. And it's a little hard to see what's written on the bottom, but I think it probably says yum. Um, I have another sort of fun side job where I translate yantras. Um, and it's, it's a bit tricky because it's handwriting. So it's um, sort of learning not only to read the letters, but learning to decipher somebody's handwriting. 
Um, so here's a yantra to Ganesha. Um, this is iconic because it has a picture of him in the middle. Sometimes you would just get Om Ganesha Namaha in the middle, salutations to Ganesha rather than um, an actual picture. Um, oops, sorry, I, uh, there we go. Um, here is another yantra to Ganesha. Um, this one has little mantras all over it. Um, you can see he's a little bit different looking here. Um, but again, there's little mantras written um, and often you use the picture to um, as a sort of focus for chanting mantras. Um, so I want to start with a mantra to Ganesha. Um, and Ganesha, on top of being the um, remover of obstacles, is considered, because of this, to be the god of beginnings. Um, so we always chant to him at the beginning. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'm going to chant it first, um, and then I'm going to chant it again, and I would like to invite you to chant with me. Um, we've decided that it would probably be problematic. I would like you all to unmute yourselves and chant together, but I think because of background noise and um, time delay, that's probably a bit problematic, but I would like to invite you the second time I chant to chant with me. Um, so always when you chant, it's a good idea to sit up straight because, and also just when you're reading Sanskrit or doing your Sanskrit homework, um, just because your spine is a channel for the sound and the vibration. So again, I'll chant it first and then you can chant with me. Um, Surya Koti Sama Prabha Nirvignam Kuru Medeva Sarva Kadyeshu Sarva Da. And then we'll do it again together. Uh, Vakratunda Mahakaya Surya Koti Sama Prabha Nirvignam Kuru Medeva Sarva Kadyeshu Sarva Da Good. So I can't tell, but I hope you all chanted with me. Um, and I hope you can feel the vibration in, start to feel in your body. Um, and one of the things, because we'll look at a few verses, um, and also we'll take a little peek at the alphabet. One of the things I want you to start to pay attention to, if you look at this chant, is um, the difference between what we call short sounds and long sounds. So if you look towards the middle, we have Vakratunda and then we have Mahakaya. So when you see the line over the A, that means that it's a long sign and it lasts about half as long as the short sounds. We have Ma and then Ha, Maha, and then we have it in the other order, Kaya, Mahakaya. And then you see it over the U in the next word, Surya. So instead of a short ooh, we get a long ooh, Surya. Mahakaya, Surya. Um, and then the other thing you'll notice as we do our chants is sometimes you will see a, um, an H after a letter, like in the last word, Sama Prabha. So this means that the letter is aspirated, which means it's got a little bit of a kind of explosive quality to the sound. Sama Prabha. And then we have it again in the next line, Nirvignam. 
Um, so I just want you to start to pay attention to those different kinds of sounds as we look at different words. Again, sadva kad yeshu, the long ah, and then sadva da, the long ah. And this means um, these words are all in what we call the vocative case, which means, or most of the words are, which means invoking. So, oh, Deva, oh, God, oh, Ganesha, who, is, who has a Vakratunda, who has a curved trunk, who has a Mahakaya, great body or great stature, um, Surya Koti Sima Prabha, whose brilliance, whose Prabha is equal to a koti, 10 million suryas, 10 million suns. Nirvignam, kurume deva, make me, kurume, make me nirvignam. Vigna means opposite, um, obstacle, and nirvigna means without obstacles. So make me without obstacles, or grant me freedom from obstacles. Sarvakar yeshu, in all things, sarvada, at all times. Um, Thank you, my Mika. Mika, yes. <laughs> I'm glad you feel it. Um, so we're going to do another chant together. Um, this one is from the uh, Taitariya Upanishad. Um, this is another, it's a pretty common chant. You might know it. Um, so again, it's a chant often done at the beginnings of things. Um, and it's a chant of togetherness, of bringing our energy together. Um, for our study. So again, I'll chant it first, and then I'll chant it again, and the second time, please um, chant with me. Um, Sahavir yam tejasvi navadhita mastu mavid vishavahai om shanti 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 hi um, and one more time, we'll do it together. Um, Sahavir yam karavavahai tejasvi navadhita mastu mavid vishavahai om shanti 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 hi Good. Okay. So similarly in this one, you can see Sahanav long ah of a two, Sahanao bunak two. This is again the aspirated ba bunak two. Sahavir yam long e. Karavava hai. Tejasvi nava long ah vitam. This is again that aspirated sound. Us to ma vid vishava hai e. And you notice that hai e. That's because this is a Vedic chant, and Vedic chants, unlike other chants, so most chants you learn, you might hear done in lots of different melodies, and that's totally fine. Um, but Vedic chants are generally done with a set melody and are sort of recorded with what are known as Vedic pitch accents, which sort of record how each um, note or syllable is meant to be pronounced. So there's often this little echo Vishavahai e, and then Om Shanti 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 he. Um, the other thing you'll notice is in Shanti, 
um, this H with a dot under it, or if you look at the um, at the Devanagari at the um, in the actual Sanskrit letters, I'll talk about what Devanagari means more in a minute. Um, those two dots that look like a colon, this is called Visarga, and it's like a little bit of an echo. And the thing about the echo is if there's a word following it, it gets a very short sound. So it's just Shanti, Shanti, but then the last one gets an echo, Shanti, because there's nothing following it. Um, Shanti, of course, means peace, own peace, peace, peace. Um, and we start out, may it protect us both now, Saha, together. May it nourish us, Bunhaktu, may it nourish us both together. May we work together with virya, with vigor. Um, may our study, may our study be tejas, have tejas, may it be illuminating or full of light. Um, and may we be free from discord. Ma vid vishavahai. Um, so again, this is a chant done often at the beginnings. Um, so I now want to talk a little bit about the word Sanskrit. So you'll often hear people say Sanskrit. Um, I think there's often a feeling that you should say Sanskrit, but the thing is um, Sanskrit or Sanskrit, however you would like to say it, is an English word. Um, so even if you say Sanskrit, it's still not a Sanskrit word because that's not the word that um, it derives from. It derives from a Sanskrit root, um, some script, which means to adorn or refine or polish or form well. Um, and if you start studying Sanskrit, you'll know that this makes some sense because it's a very refined, polished, well thought out language. Um, and this comes from the prefix sum, which means together, and then the verb kri, which means to do or make. Um, and so from samskri, from the verb samskri, we get the word samskrita. And samskrita is the real word in Sanskrit for Sanskrit. Um, so if you really want to say it correctly, you say samskrita. And samskrita means refined or polished or well-formed. And as I said, it's a very um, methodical language. As you'll see, if you start to study, everything makes it might be complex, but it all makes a lot of sense. Um, and everything's been pretty well thought out. Um, and classical Sanskrit, which is what we will study if you um, take my Sanskrit course starting next month. Um, classical Sanskrit was codified by Panini in about the fifth century or about 500, 500 BC. Um, in his text, which is called the Ashtadhyayi, Ashta, like in Ashtanga, Ashta means eight. Ashtadhyayi means the eight chapters. And so his book is, um, it's a text of eight chapters, which um, it's in sutra form, like the Yoga Sutra. And it sort of lays out the rules for studying Sanskrit. Now, it's a quite difficult text because it's not even really written in Sanskrit. It's written in this sort of meta language, you could say. It's kind of, it's almost like math. It kind of, it's like a sort of scientific language that codifies the different rules. So even if you learn Sanskrit, you can't necessarily pick up Panini's grammar and learn it. However, you will learn the rules that he laid down then. Um, Vedic Sanskrit, which the Vedas, the older texts, the Rig Veda, the Sama Veda, Yajur Veda, and Atharva Veda were written in is a bit different. And we won't look at that so much, um, but it's thought that Vedic Sanskrit started more around like 1500 BC. Um, and lots I could say about that, but that's a whole other, um, whole other topic. So back to classical Sanskrit, um, as I said, we will learn the rules of slowly. Um, of classical Sanskrit. And the traditional method of learning was actually through oral recitation. So traditionally, students would learn entire texts, including um, Panini's Ashtadhyayi, by heart. And they would learn the entire text by heart, or you might learn the entire Yoga Sutra by heart before being taught what anything meant. 
Now, I think most of us Westerners have a hard time with that idea. We want to know, we want to know what we're chanting. We want to know what things mean. Um, so I try to do a little bit of both. So we do chant, we do sort of learn things that we don't necessarily know what they mean, but then I'll also teach you what they mean. Um, and so I like to think that if we approach it from both directions, um, they, ki they kind of come together and you will get both the sound and the vibration as well as the meaning. Um, and the word Samskrita is also, um, it's used in contrast to the word Prakrit. Um, the word Prakrit means natural and it's the word given for um, the sort of more spoken languages that languages like um, Hindi and other sort of more modern languages evolved out of. And Prakrit or Prakrita languages um, are less refined. They're more natural. They mean, it means that they're much more, um, they're much more easily spoken. So even somebody who would consider themselves a Sanskritist and even somebody who might speak in Sanskrit, and there aren't very many people who do that, but there are a few, even them, if they wanted to say, you know, can you please go to the store and get me some milk, they would probably use whatever the um, local language is. And that's what the Prakrit sort of evolved to do is sort of for more generic speech, whereas Sanskrit is kind of considered a refined, more of a refined language, a literary language, a religious language, a spiritual language. Um, and from this root, samskri, you'll see also on the bottom, we get the word samskara, which you might also know. Um, samskara is the word for a mental impression. So you might have a samskara, you know, if you hear the sounds of Sanskrit and you think, oh, this sounds familiar, um, that's a samskara. It's like some previous impression that's been made on your brain. Um, and it means also refining or perfection or impression. Um, so here is perhaps um, the most familiar sound or syllable in Sanskrit, the syllable om. Um, and it's sort of, the syllable itself is kind of a combination of, um, of three letters. We have something that sort of resembles the letter a uh, on the left. We have something that sort of resembles a shorthand for the letter U on the right. And we have a little sort of M symbol up top. And so even though it's generally written OM, the O sound, as we'll see in a minute when we get to the alphabet, actually combines the U uh and the U sounds and you get OM. Um, here is another sort of a sort of hand-drawn yantra of om. Um, most of these are actually sideways. The one on the right is straight up. The other ones, you can see the little circle with the dot is sideways. Um, as I think I said before, I have this job translating yantras. I have a friend who collects them. Um, and you'll see that inside of this yantra are some mantras. Um, again, written in Devanagari script. Um, so just to show you some variations, this is that this is that same syllable ohm, it's just a different kind of handwritten version. Um, here is, um, if you look closely at this, this is another yantra and it just says over and over and over again, Rama, 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 Rama. Um, which if you study even a little bit of Sanskrit, you will be able to read this because it's pretty simple and it's the same thing over and over and over and over again, which is how mantras are meant to be um, repeated through japa, which means recitation um, or repetition. Um, just showing you a few, a few pretty pictures. Um, this one also has, this is known as a magic square in English. It also has lots of different, um, mantras inside and these are just syllables um and the word for syllable in sanskrit is akshara um which literally means shara means perishable akshara so if you stick an a uh at the beginning of anything it negates it so like himsa is violence ahimsa nonviolence 
akshara means imperishable. And imperishable is the word for any syllable. And it's thought that all of the sounds of the Sanskrit language um, are imperishable, are primordial, um, which is why mantras take on this power. Here's another yantra. This one is a depiction, um, I couldn't fit the whole thing on here, but of a few of the chakras with little pictures, um, again, with the seed syllables in the middle. Um, here is a mandala. Um, this one mostly has numbers, different numbers inside of it. So geometric shapes are often used. Mandala means circle. Um, geometric shapes are often used um, with yantras in with mantras inside. Um, and so here's another verse for you. Um, and this is from the Garanda Samhita, which is a much more recent text. Um, and this one, I think, gives a good reason for studying Sanskrit. Um, but again, let's chant it first. So again, I will chant it first. Um, and then the second time, please chant with me. Abhyasat karivarnanam Yatha Shastrani Buddhayet Tatha Yugam Samasadya Tatva Gnanam Chalabhyate And together. Abhyasat Karivarnanam Yatha Shastrani Buddhayet Tatha Yugam Samasadya Tatva Gnanam Chalabhyate So again, you'll notice the long sounds, Abhyasat, which means from practice. Abhyasa, you might know the word Abhyasa. Abhyasa means practice or repeated practice. So just as from abhyasa, from repeated practice, um, kadivarnanam, this means the letters beginning with ka. Ka, as we'll see in a minute, is actually the first consonant of the alphabet. Um, so just as from the repeated study of the letters beginning with ka or the alphabet, one may come to know, bhodayet, come to understand shastras, sacred texts or teachings of wisdom, tata, so too in that way, by means of yoga, one may attain jnana, one may attain knowledge of tattva, of the real truth. Um, again, jnanam, you'll notice the long a, bodhayet, labhyate, there's again that aspirated sound. Um, and I like to sort of take this verse in reverse. So if you sort of, because probably more of you are yoga practitioners than Sanskritists at this point, um, so if you look at the second line first, so by means of yoga, one may attain knowledge of the real truth. So too, in that way, from repeated study of the alphabet, one may come to understand teachings of wisdom. And these teachings of wisdom, these, the yoga philosophy and the yoga texts will hopefully add new depth of meaning and enrich your, um, your yoga practice, which is the idea that you know, the more you understand where the practice comes from, the more it will add to, um, to your practice if you are a yoga practitioner. Um, so we're going to look now at the Devanagari alphabet. Um, so Sanskrit is generally written in Devanagari. Nagari actually means city and Deva means God. So it literally means city of the gods. Um, and this has been the traditional script um, for um, many years. It's sort of evolved um, towards the beginning of the Common Era. Um, and it became more standardized, of course, with the advent of printing. Um, and, but I should say, um, Sanskrit can be written in any script. So if you're traveling around India looking at manuscripts, which um, 
I'm going to do soon. If you are in Karnataka, for example, you might find a Sanskrit text written in Kannada, which is the local language. Or you could find one written in Hindi, or you could find one written in Tamil, or it can be written in lots of different scripts as long as the sounds are preserved. Um, so we're gonna look at the alphabet in a moment, um, but um, I should say also, you'll see here the, um, we have the Devanagari um, letters, and then we also have next to it the transliteration. Um, so the transliteration scheme that we're using here is what is known as IAST, I-A-S-T, which is the International Alphabet for Sanskrit Transliteration, I think. Um, and it's been the academic standard since the late 1800s. Um, and it's useful to learn it in this format. You'll see other formats in different texts. Um, however, this because this is the standard, if you learn it, um, most, most texts these days, or there's a big movement towards it, towards um, towards um, typing in and making e-texts of as many texts as possible. And these texts then become searchable, which is really fun if you're looking for a particular words. So if you're looking for yoga or if you're looking for karma or whatever you're looking for, you can type it in and you can search it. And if you know how to type it in correctly, it will tell you where in the text this appears for all texts that have been um, codified. Um, so there are um, 49 letters in the alphabet. There are a couple of add-on sounds. There's one sound that I actually don't give you here. People always ask, I have a different number, a different number in my alphabet than I actually say. I'll tell you what that is in a minute. Um, but we will look first together. Again, we're just going to look at the alphabet briefly because I will go into it in a lot more detail if you take my intro to Sanskrit class, um, which I hope you will. Um, so just taking a look first um, at the vowels, um, which are called svara. So again, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, these um, the vowels, the first vowels are made up of a short sound followed by a long sound. So our first sound is the letter a, uh, and then the long sound is ah. Uh. And these first sounds are articulated in the throat, in the back of the mouth. So we get a, uh, ah, uh, and you're welcome to say it along with me at home, a, uh, ah. Uh. These next two signs, again, there's a short sound and a long sound. And these are what is known as palatal, and you say them with a smile, e, and then e, so e, e. And then the next ones are what's called labial, which means they're pronounced at the lips, and we get oo, and then the long version oo, oo, oo. So we get a, a, e, e, oo, oo. And I always, um, encourage people to sort of over enunciate it first. So make, make a big shape with your mouth. It will help you learn the different sounds. Um, and then we have a couple more here. These are a little harder to say. R, which is kind of like a trilled R. R, and then the long version. R, R, R. And then there's one more sound, um, one more vowel, which is not used very often. It's used in about one word, actually. Um, and it is lara, lara. And the sort of the um, extra vowel that I was alluding to before that makes it 49 letters instead of 48 is a long version of lara, which is lari. I don't include it because it's actually never used. The grammarians sort of just invented it for symmetry, which they do sometimes. Um, but you will never see it. So, so far we have a, a, e, e, U, U, R, R, L, R. And then we have these next sounds, which are what are kind of known as, they're sort of like diphthongs, um, which means they put two letters together. So the first two put a uh, and e together. So if you roll from the a uh to the e, you get a, 
a, and then you can also get I, I. So we get a, I, and then these next two go from the back of the throat, the uh, to the lips, ooh, oh, oh. And this, as I was saying before, is how we get om and why you'll sometimes see om written A-U-M is that the letter O actually consists of an uh and an ooh, O. And then we can also get ow. Again, moving from the back of the throat to the lips, ow. And then we have these two little special sounds that add on. The first is called an anusfara, which is a little dot. And you can stick it on top of anything, but here we have it on an uh. So we get um. And then our next letter is what's known as a visarga. I mentioned this before. This is the H with the dot or the little thing that looks like a colon, which makes an echo kind of a sound. So here we get aha. Uh -huh. But you could have it like we had on shanti, shantihi. So we have um, aha. Uh -huh. So all the vowels together, a, uh, a, uh, e, e, u, u, r, r, l, r, a, i, o, ow, um, uh. -huh. So now we will move on to the consonants. Again, I'm just going to go through it pretty quickly today because we're not really learning it. I just want to give you a sense of the different sounds. Um. So our first line here is what's known as guttural. Um, guttural is like the uh and the ah, which means it's pronounced at the back of the throat. Um, our first two sounds, well, let's just say the first one is k, and then the second one you'll see with the H and the transliteration, this is the aspirated version that I was saying that has a bit of an explosive sound. So this is k. So we have k, k. K, K. Similarly, same spot in the throat. We get G and then G, the aspirated version. And then we have a nasal. So the fifth column is always a nasal, which is N. So we have K, K, G, G, N. This is the N in Ashtanga, the eight limbs or parts. Um, our second line is palatal. Palatal is like the E and the E that we learned before. Um, and so it's pronounced with a smile. So we have ch, and then the aspirated version with the H, ch, and then j, and j, the aspirated version, and then our nasal, ny. Ch, ch, j, j, ny. And then we have what are known as retroflex sounds. So retroflex means that tongue is behind the teeth. This is like the r. So we get t, and then the aspirated t, and then d, and t, and the nasal n. Now notice here, this is really important in the transliteration, there is a dot under the consonant. And this is how you know that it's this retroflex letter, tongue behind the teeth, t, t, d, d, no. And then turning to the dental, so dental looks the same in English, but it doesn't have the dot underneath. You'll notice the Sanskrit, the Devanagari looks quite different. This is the tongue between the teeth. So we get ta and then aspirated ta and then da ta and the nasal na. So ta ta da da na. And then moving to the lips, labial, we get P, P, aspirated, B, B, and then M. So this is like the U at the lips. P, P, B, B, M. So the whole, all the consonants, I'll just say them one more time. K, K, G, G, N, Ch, Ch, J, J, N, T, T, D, D, N, Ta, ta, da, ta, na, pa, pa, ba, ba, ma. And then we just have a few more letters. These are sort of extra sounds. The first ones are what is known as semi vowels, because there's sort of a cross between a consonant and the vowel. First one is palatal with a smile, ya. And then the second one is um, retroflex, ra. 
or sometimes r, and then dental, l, tongue between the teeth, and then labial at the lips, v, y, r, l, v. And then we have what are known as sibilants, s sounds. So you'll notice these are also important to notice. The first and the second one, the sh, which has a little diagonal line on top, and the sh, which has a dot underneath, even though it's just an s, these are both different kinds of shas, but they're different. So the first one is palatal with a smile, sh, like in shanti or ganesha or shiva. Second one is with um, the tongue behind the teeth. This is retroflex, sh. This is like in ashtanga. So we get sh, 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 sh. And then the third letter on the bottom is a s. This is dental. So this is just a regular S sound. And then we move back to the back of the throat, ha. So sh, sh, s, ha. Semi vowels again, ya, ra, la, va, sh, sh, s, ha. And again, we will go into this in a lot more detail, but just to give you a sense of the different sounds so that when you are chanting, you get a little bit of an, of an idea of how it works. And you'll notice, you may have noticed that we didn't learn letters the way you would in English, like B, C, K. We've learned letters with the letter A, uh, with the vowel A uh attached. So we don't learn Y, we learn Y. Yeah. We don't learn K or K, we learn K. And we do this because it's a bit easier to pronounce um, like this. So the, the, this is the, the alphabet really, it's really sort of what's known as an alpha syllabary. It's made up of syllables rather than letters. Um, so does anybody have any questions before I keep talking? Um, we haven't had any questions come through. We did have someone that was on the call that actually had to go to a workshop that was interested um, in any recommendations for further study um, for someone who's had some uh, Sanskrit and is not a beginner. So maybe that's a, a question for the Facebook page or maybe something you'll touch on at the end of our, our talk today. Sure, yes, I definitely, we can, um, we can get that. Okay. Um, in the gutturals, doesn't the end have a dot above in transliteration? Yes, it should. Did it not? Is my, oops, you're absolutely right. It should have a dot and not a line on top. That is an old version of my alphabet. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, I will correct that. If, in my book, there should be a dot on top. My old font didn't used to make the dot on top, um, but, you're in, but my old font was not a JPEG file. Um, but yes, there should be a dot on top. Um, anybody else? Um, okay. So, and yeah, if you have questions as I go along, please, again, do, don't be shy, do ask them. Um, and yeah, I will make recommendations at the end um, for further study. Um, so, I just want to, again, look a little bit at words that are cognate, meaning similar or related um, to English. So words that in Sanskrit might sound like a word we know in English. Um, and there's quite a lot of these. And we see them because um, English and Sanskrit have the same ancestor. Um, so the ancestor of Sanskrit is considered um, an Indo-European language, which comes from this sort of what they call Proto-Indo-European, which is basically a reimagined, it's like reimagining backwards what this language looks like, which gave birth to, um, to English, to Latin, to Greek, to um, most of the Romance languages, to um, lots of other languages. So you'll see, um, you'll see a lot of similarities because they have um, the sort of the same ancestral language. Um, so learning Sanskrit will also help you with your English um, and maybe other languages. So just some common words in Sanskrit, we have matra, notice the long a, and then this was our vowel r with the dot under it, matra. 
which is mother. Um, similarly, like mater, right? In lots of languages, um, in Latin, lots of languages have similar words for mother. And similarly, patre, father, um, or pater, um, bratre, brother, uh, svasre, um, again, all of these end with the R with the dot under it, which is the vowel R. Um, it takes a little getting used to that an R can be a vowel, um, but that's what this is. When you see the R with the dot in it, under it, it means the vowel R. And th this is the same, I don't have it up on the screen, but like in the name Krishna, you'll often see Krishna spelled as K-R-I-S-H-N-A. But in Sanskrit, you would write it as K. R with the dot under it, S with the dot under it, N with the dot under it, and then A. So all of those extra letters are added so that we can pronounce it in English, but actually it's just a vowel R. So that R with the dot under it is pronounced sort of like an R-I, R, Krishna, or Svasra, or Duhitra, which is daughter. Um, some other common words. Um, Avatara, which is avatar, um, which has become quite a common um, common word. Avatar, 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 meaning a um, an incarnation, and it's part of the title of my book, um, Yoga Avataranam, which I know it is hard to pronounce, um, but it's actually two words put together. It is yoga plus avataranam. Avataranam is like avatar or avatara. It's just a different version of it. So yoga avataranam becomes yoga avataranam, which means the incarnation or descent, or it can also come to mean translation of yoga, which is why um, I named my book that. Um, other common words you might know, the word deva, which means God, or daiva, which means divine. So same root, daiva, deva, divine. Um, jnana, which means knowledge, is similar to gnosis, um, same kind of sound, jnana, jnana gnosis. Um, another word that's similar is manas, which means mind, um, and nama, which means name. Um, let's see what else. Dve, which means two or duo or dual is also similar. Um, trini, which means three or a trident, you know, that tri or trikonasana, you might know. Trikonasana, kona means angle, tri means three, so trikona, three angles. Um, bandhana, which means like binding, is where similar cognate with bandana also used to tie or bind. Um, jungla, here you get the dot over the end. Um, jungla, jungle, or sarpa, serpent. Um, and if, just a few more. Again, I could keep going, but just to give you some ideas of words that you might already know without even know that you knowing that you know them. Um, danta is tooth, um, so like dental. Uh, Manu is the name of the first man or man. Uh, Manu, man, now, you might know from the word navasana, boat pose, um, is nautical, related to nautical, meaning boat. Um, pada, or sometimes pada, is foot, where we get pedal or pedestrian. Um, so same root, pud, pud, pud ped. Um, and just one more, sama, sama is, means same or equal. Um, so a lot of vocabulary that you might know without even knowing that you know it. Um, and then just a few other words you might know that have kind of become part of the English language. Um, karma, which literally means action, right? So we think about karma's become, yeah, used so frequently in English. You know, that is my karma um, sort of basically the accumulate, but it, it really means like the accumulated actions that lead to other um, things happening or other actions or to where you are in your life. Um, dharma, 
which means justice, duty, right action, doing your dharma, sort of what really means like what you're meant to be doing. Um, another word you might know is prana, right? Which means breath, vital air or energy. Um, and this also in common currency, if you know um, the clothing brand prana, you notice they make the A in the middle a capital A and they make it a capital A because it's meant to be a long A. Ah. Sometimes you'll see a long A ah written with a capital prana. But again, notice this is a retroflex na, so the tongue should be behind the teeth, prana. Um, you may also know the word namaste, often used at the end um, of a yoga class or a beginning. Um, but literally, you know, people give all kinds of fancy translations for what namaste means, but it really means, namas means a bow, and te means to you. So namaste means a bow to you. Um, another word you might be familiar with that you might not have thought of is the svastika, um, which is actually, if you've ever been to India or seen Indian, sort of Indian art or paintings, um, you will see swastikas everywhere. And it's a little bit alarming often for people at first, um, but they're backwards in India um, as opposed to um, what we've seen um, more familiarly. Um, so they're backwards, but it literally means, svasti means auspiciousness. Su means good, asti means it is. So it's like, it is good and ka is a diminutive. So it's actually, a, it's meant to be originally a sign of auspiciousness. Um, of course, as often happens, signs can be taken and appropriated and other things, um, all other kinds of meaning attributed to them. But that is where the svastika comes from. Um, and shanti, we talked about already in the chant, shanti meaning peace. Um, again, long ah, this is that S with the line over it, the Sha with a smile, Shanti. Um, where am I? Um, and just a few other words that you might know, especially because we've been looking at some, um, we've been looking at some yantras. So yantra, um, just skipping to the second one for a minute, yantra, this suffix tra at the end means an instrument. So this is one of the things you start to learn as you as you learn some Sanskrit is there's a lot of repetition and there are different prefixes that mean the same thing over and over. I mentioned uh always negates something. There's suffixes that have particular meaning. So the suffix tra means an instrument. So a yantra is actually a, an instrument for restraining the mind. So it's for concentrating the mind on one diagram, one place. Um, and a yantra is used as part of tantra. Um, and tantra is literally an instrument for stretching. It originally um, means like, a, it means like, like threads on a loom. So it's really a sort of word for weaving. Um, but it's come to represent a system of different, um, various different ideas and practices woven together. Um, but yantra is one of the methods used in tantra and as is mantra, um, which we've already mentioned and we've been chanting some mantras. So mantra is again, literally tra meaning an instrument of the manas, an instrument of the mind. Um, and here is another yantra. This is to Sarasvati. Sarasvati is the goddess of knowledge of learning of wisdom she's usually seen with this the veena um the instrument i um, mean you can see this is again an iconic yantra which means there's a picture in the middle as opposed to some other ones where you might just get um a sort of some sanskrit words a mantra in the middle but you do see there's mantras all around not just to sarasvati but to all of the different gods who might be in the different directions um to sort of protect the yantra. Um, there are also, these are what are known as occult yantras, which means they can be used for lots of different purposes. Sometimes they're used medicinally. Sometimes they're used kind of as spells. So if somebody's bothering you, you can have a special yantra to make them go away. 
or you can have one to attract somebody. You can have a yantra for peace. Um, they can serve all different kinds of purposes, um, but generally you want somebody who knows what they're doing to make you one. Um, here's another yantra. It's in the form of a snake. You can see it again has little mantras on it. Um, and this is to the god of snakes. And another thing you might be familiar with, maybe not exactly in this form, is snakes and ladders. Or you may know it as the game Shoots and Ladders, which I grew up with. Um, but it actually comes from um, this snakes and ladders. And in this picture, um, I just have, it just has numbers in the different squares. I have some other ones, but the pictures aren't so great. But often you'll see written in the squares different qualities. And so it's actually, it was originally used, and this is where we get it from, as a teaching game to teach people ultimately the aim of liberation and sort of teaching about morality, um, which is often done, right? So you see like, yeah, if you like in shoots and ladders, you can go up a ladder or you can slide down a snake. Um, and this is done in terms of often the three gunas. Guna means quality. This is another word you might know. Um, the gunas are considered qualities of the mind. Um, and there are three gunas. The gunas are rajas. Rajas means activity. Um, rajas is the feeling if you drink too much coffee, you sort of have a lot of adrenaline and you're talking too fast and um, that's rajas. Rajas can be a good thing. Rajas is the thing that makes you get up in the morning and do things. So we all need a little bit of rajas. But again, you'd see not in the diagram I just had, but in other diagrams of snakes and ladders, sometimes there'll be a little rajas square, which might send you sliding down a snake. Um, similarly, there might be a little tamas square. Tamas is inertia. Tamas is sort of the heavy guna. This is um, the quality if you've eaten too much meat and potatoes. I just think of it as like a post Thanksgiving kind of feeling. Um, but you need a bit of it because this is what gets you to sit still and do things, do your Sanskrit homework. Um, little tidbit of Thomas is good. Again, too much of it might send you sliding down one of those snakes. Um, as opposed to sattva, which might send you climbing up the ladder. Sattva is the guna of equilibrium um, and balance. And um, yeah, so the three gunas are sort of part of um, part of yoga philosophy, part of Sankhya, which is the originally the sort of sister science of yoga philosophy. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the gunas in a minute. Um, so I just want to look first at um, the first sutra of the Yoga Sutra. Um, which says atta, and if you look at the first word, the first letter of the first word in Devanagari, that is the letter a, which we saw before, which is the first letter of the Devanagari alphabet. Right, so we get atta, aspirated ta, atta yoganushasanam. Atta yoganushasanam means now there is the anushasanam, there is the teaching of yoga. Um, and the commentators go on in great length about what this means. Um, and the idea is that not it's not just now, it's not just today on this Sunday afternoon in August. It is now in this Sunday afternoon in August because it is the auspicious moment, because you are ready in this exact moment to learn this is going to happen now. Everything in your life up until now made you ready for this very moment that there will be the teaching of yoga. Um, the commentators also go on talking about the gunas here. And they talk about how the aim in yoga practice is first to overcome rajas. Um, rajas, as I mentioned, the guna of um, activity. So first, so if you, are, do practice yoga, you may notice, or you may have noticed that when you first started, you had a lot of energy, you were really excited, you wanted to do it all the time, lots of rajas. If you practice for a bit longer, you get some tamas, so I'd rather stay in bed, maybe I'll skip today, I don't want to do it. And then ultimately, you want to cultivate more sattva, equilibrium. 
But in the Yoga Sutra, also in the Bhagavad Gita, in other yoga texts, the goal is to ultimately become nirguna or qualityless beyond the gunas. Um, so that is the goal that's also implied here. Now there is the teaching of yoga where that will happen. Um, and I just want to show you um, one of the fundamental principles of Sanskrit, which is illustrated here. Again, another reason why it is helpful to learn a bit of Sanskrit is to understand these principles. So one of the main ideas is what's known as sandhi. Sandhi means junction or joining together. And these are rules for joining two words together in order to create a more pleasant, smooth sound. And this can be a bit intimidating at first. There are lots of rules. But the idea is we learn them one at a time and they're meant to make it easier to pronounce words together. So for example, in our the sutra we just looked at, we had atha yoga anushasanam. Yoga anushasanam is two words. We have yoga plus anushasanam. And we have our first Sunday rule here that if we have a short a uh, or a long a uh, plus Again, either a short a uh, or a long a, uh, stick them together and we get a long a uh, because you can't have anything bigger than a long a uh, basically. So a uh or a uh plus a uh or a uh is a. Uh. So yoga plus anushasanam is yoga anushasanam, the instruction or teaching of or on yoga. Similarly, basically the names of all of the asanas. So for example, bakasana, crane pose, baka, plus asana is bakasana. Take the short a uh, at the end of baka, add it to asana, and you get bakasana. Similarly, trikonasana, um, parshvakonasana, um, baddha konasana, anything, every single asana, basically, you have the name, you stick it onto asana, and you get that long asana. Also in ashtanga, you have ashta, which means eight, plus anga, which means limb or part. Ashtanga means eight limbs or parts. Um, there's lots of other rules for sandhi, um, but this is the first one, the most basic to learn. It also applies to the other short, simple vowels, or short or long, simple vowels. You could also take an e or an e, plus an e or an e, and you would get a long e. You could take an oo or an oo plus an oo or an oo and you'd get a long oo. Um, and, but we'll, we'll get to that later. Um, so for now, I want to look um, at the second Yoga Sutra. And I wanna spend a little bit of time um, looking at different translations. Um, so the second the second sutra says yoga shchitta vritti nirodhaha. Again, yoga shchitta vritti nirodhaha. So maybe I'll just chant the first two sutras just so you get a sense of how they can be chanted. Um, so the first one we did before, atta yoga anushasanam, atta yoga anushasanam. And then the second one, Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodha. And again, Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodha. So if you look at this, you might notice a couple of things. One, if you look at the Devanagari, it looks like it's one word. So don't worry about what it says, but just look. If you look at the line on the top, it kind of looks like it's one big word. And then if you look at the transliteration, you see that it's actually four words. Um, so this is one of the things you start to learn as you learn to read is um, in Devanagari, you wanna make it, you wanna put it all together as much as possible. Stick the words together through Sunday or joining, which I just talked about. So originally, um, this actually is a different so, uh, Sunday rule. You would have had yogaha, with a visarga, yoga, chitta vritti nirodha. But because they think it would be more pleasant to hear it this way, the visarga, the aha, becomes a sha, and we get yoga, chitta vritti nirodha. So the other thing you'll notice in the transliteration, you may have noticed this in the verses we looked at before, is that 
Sometimes I leave a space and sometimes I have dashes between the words. So when I leave a space, it means that they're two separate words. When there's dashes, it means that they are in compound. And Sanskrit loves compounds, especially in the Yoga Sutras, there are lots of long compounds. And compounds are very efficient because they stick words together. However, they don't always tell you how the different words relate to each other. You have to infer that from the context or you have to read a commentary. The commentaries will often explain to you how the different words relate. So here we have yoga, chitta vritti nirodha. So yoga is the nirodha, is the stilling of the vrittis, of the fluctuations of the chitta, of the mind. So this is just one translation, my translation, but I just wanna give you an idea of how many different possibilities we have here. So the word yoga, for example, and I'm only giving you a few definitions here. If you were to look in the dictionary, I can't remember how many it is, but it's like 70 something definitions of yoga. So these are just a few that actually apply here. Yoga can mean joining, uniting, union, junction, combination, means, a yoke, a result, a remedy, deep and abstract meditation, concentration of the mind, contemplation of the Supreme Spirit. Um, it also has lots of different other meanings. I believe it can mean something like a trick or um, if you, I have it listed in my introduction, if you, um, if you get my book um, or if you look at a Sanskrit dictionary, there are lots of other possible meanings. These are the ones that, these are the ones that just might possibly relate to what we're talking about here, the system of philosophy of yoga. Chitta as well can have lots of different meanings. So chitta can mean mind, it can also mean heart. It can mean reason, intellect, consciousness, which is made up of the buddhi, um, which is the intellect, the understanding, the discerning faculty, um, the manas, the mind we talked about, and also the ahankara, which literally means the eye maker, which is the ego. So these are the three parts of consciousness. Remember we have yoga, chitta, vritti, nirodha, Vritti comes from the root of vrit, which means to turn. So vritti is a state, a movement, a fluctuating state, a turning. So these are the turnings of the chitta, of the mind. And we have the nirodha, the restraint, the stilling, the check, suppression, control, or cessation. So these are the four, four words that make up the second sutra of the Yoga Sutra, yoga, chitta, vritti, nirodha. Um, so I just want to show you a few different translations just to give you an idea of, um, of how many choices a translator is making at any moment, um, which as I said at the beginning, you often don't know this if you're just reading one translation. So for example, um, Barbara Stoller, Stoller Miller, this is one, I think it's maybe it's the Penguin edition. Um, she says yoga is the cessation of the turnings of thought. So same thing, right? She says, cessation, nirodha, um, it can mean that the stopping cessation, the turnings, the vrittis um, of the chitta, of thought or the mind. Edwin Bryant says, again, they're all, these ones are all pretty similar, but notice they've made different choices. Yoga is the stilling, stilling of the changing states of mind. And again, stilling is a bit, maybe a bit different to cessation. Um, BKS Iyengar also says cessation. Yoga is the cessation of movements in the consciousness. Again, just slightly different choices here. Um, Ian Witcher said, which this is a little bit different. Yoga is the cessation of, and then he puts in brackets. When somebody puts some things in brackets, it means this is definitely not in the text. They're adding this. Yoga is the cessation of the misidentification with the modifications of the mind. Um, and modifications meaning change here, but it's interesting. He's written some interesting articles um, and his translation I think is quite interesting and different um, because he talks about it being, you know, it's not that your mind stops, it's that you stop identifying with the ego, with the one who, the thinker. Um, instead, you sort of, you're, you allow your thoughts to be still enough that you can actually see your true self. Um, 
I kind of like to think about it this way. I like to think like it's as if you turn the volume button way down on the repetitive thoughts and you turn the volume way up on your inner, your true self, your Atman. Um, and just to give you a couple more. Um, so Georg Fierstein says yoga is the restriction um, of the fluctuations of consciousness. Again, pretty similar here. And then here's one that's just totally different. Um, obviously this one is a bit more interpretive, but he's still talking about the same sutra. Um, Kofi Busia, who is a longtime Iyengar teacher um, and a very interesting person. He has a very interesting translation of the Yoga Sutra. I think you can find it online if you want just a totally different interpretation. He doesn't even use the word yoga. He just says wholeness. Wholeness consists of a complete grasp and command over the process of being and becoming aware. Again, totally different. He's, this is completely not literal, but he's using it. He's, this is his translation of, um, of the same thing. So again, those are just a few translations of the second sutra. Yoga shchitta vritti nirodha. Yoga is the stilling of the fluctuations, the vrittis, the turning thoughts of the chitta, of the mind. Um, so here, just to give you an idea of what a manuscript might look like, this is a manuscript of the text that I'm translating, the Upper Akshanibhuti that I found in the library in Oxford. Um, this is, yeah, just one, one manuscript. Um, Here's a picture of another manuscript. Um, and here is a picture of a verse from the Bhagavad Gita. Um, and this is, um, this is actually, when I first saw it, I thought, oh, what a, what a lovely verse from the Gita. And then I read it and I realized that um, it's a verse that you may know or um, you, may, you may not even know that you know. Um, but if you know Robert Oppenheimer's, what he said um, after inventing um, the atomic bomb, um, he said, now I am become death. He says, now I am become death, the, 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 destroyer, the destroyer of worlds or something like that. And it comes from this verse. Um, from the Bhagavad Gita, the one that was in the, um, the picture I just showed you, chapter 11, number 32, this is the chapter in which Krishna reveals his cosmic form. And what's interesting here is that he's making a choice here. Um, the beginning of the text says, Kalo Smi, I am Kala. I am Kala, in most translations, will actually translate as time. So, but ta kala means time, kala also means death. So you can say, I am time, I am death. Um, so kalo smi lokakshaya krit pravrito lokan samahartum iha pravritaha rite pi tvam nebavishyanti sarve ye vastita pratyani keshu yodaha. So I am time or I am death the powerful cause of the destruction of the world, of the loka, who has pravritta, who has arisen here to destroy, annihilate the worlds. Ritte pi, even without tvam, even without you, these worlds will cease to exist. These warriors who are arrayed, avastitaha pratyani keshu, on the opposite side. Um, so I don't want to go too much into the Bhagavad Gita or you know, I, most of you probably know a bit about the story. Um, we will talk about it more as verses come up in future classes. But I, th I just want you to be aware of how sort of popular, um, how popular these Sanskrit words have become. You also may have heard Sanskrit words in Beatles songs or um, Madonna or other, lots of other, um, popular songs have used Sanskrit, Sanskrit words. Um, so we'll now look at another um, maybe more pleasant verse from, um, oops, from, the, um, from the Bhagavad Gita. 
Um, this is Bhagavad Gita verse, um, chapter seven, um, verse number one. So I'll chant this one. Maybe I'll chant it and then you can chant it um, as well. So we have Shri Bhagavan Upacha. This just means Krishna speaks, as you'll see in a minute. Um, Maya Saktamana Partha Yogam Yunjanmad Ashraya Asam Shayam Samagramam Yatagnyasya Sita Chrenu. And then see if you can do it with me. Maya Saktamana Partha. Yogam Yunjanmad Ashraya Asam Shayam Samagramam Yatagnyas Yasita Chrenu. Okay, so, um, so I just want to point out one thing um, before we're going to look at this in different translations as well. But one thing you'll notice, um, both in the verses we did at the beginning, the verse to Ganesha, and in most of the verses from the Bhagavad Gita, not the sutras, um, because those are terse forms, but in most verses, we have what this, this kind of verse, which is known as shloka meter, or sometimes anushtub. And it means each verse is divided into four padas, or quarters, and in this meter, each quarter has eight syllables. So we have Maya Sakta Mana Partha Yogam Yunjanmad Ashraya Asam Shayam Samagramam Yatagnyasya Sita Chrenu. So it's eight and eight. It was the same thing in the Bhagavad Gita verse we did. Vakratunda Mahakaya Surya Koti Samaprabha. I know I did in a different um, tune lat before. Nirvignam Kuru Me Deva Sadva Kad Yeshu Sadva Da. Eight. So again, it's divided into four quarters, eight syllables in each quarter. Um, so again, want to show you a few. Um, a few different translations of this. Again, just to give you a sense of how many different directions this can go. So from Winthrop Sargent's translation, which is the one I generally recommend because um, he has the Devanagari, he has a transliteration, and he has a word-by-word -word breakdown. So he actually gives you um, the definite definitions of each word and he also tells you what part of speech they are. So it's a really useful tool. Um, so he translates this as, the blessed Lord spoke, with mind absorbed in me, Arjuna, practicing yoga dependent on me, you shall know me completely, without doubt, hear that. So that's one. Here's another one from Graham Schweig's um, translation, which I really like. I think he has a nice line between sort of literal but also poetic. Um, the beloved Lord said, with mind deeply attached to me, O Partha, practicing yoga with dependence on me, you shall know me completely, beyond all doubt. Hear about how this is so. Again, you can tell that it's the same thing, but it is definitely quite different. Um, Here's another one. This one is um, by Nick Sutton. It's, it's much more, it's just in sentence form. It's not even in verse form at all. The Lord said, now hear, O Parta, how you can have full knowledge of me without any doubts by attaching your mind to me and practicing yoga dedicated to me. Um, and here is another one. Barbara Stoller Miller, we looked at her um, Yoga Sutra translation before. Lord Krishna, practice discipline in my protection with your mind focused on me. Arjuna, hear how you can know me completely without doubt. And again, you'll see here different choices, subtle choices, but different choices are being made here. And just a couple more. Um, Lori Patton, the blessed one said, son of Prata, hear this. 
with your mind intent on me, join to yoga, your refuge in me. In that way, you will know me completely, without doubt. Um, and we'll look at one more. This is kind of an older one. Um, this one is sort of more like Shakespearean English, I would say. The Blessed One said, with mind attached to me, son of Prata, practicing discipline. Again, note they've a bunch of people have translated yoga as discipline rather than yoga. Practicing disciplines with reliance on me, without doubt, me entirely, how thou shalt know that here. Um, so lots of different choices being made here. Um, and so I want to just look at one more verse from the Bhagavad Gita in different translations. And then we'll see if you, um, then yeah, if anybody has any questions that you've been holding, we will, um, we will turn to that. So here again is the second verse from chapter seven. Um, so again, I'll chant it and then you can chant it with me. Jnanam te ham savig jnanam idam vaksham yashe shatha yaj jnatva neha bhu yon yaj jnatva vyam avashishyate. And again together. Jnanam te ham savig jnanam idam vaksham yashe shataha yaj jnatva neha bhuyo nyaj jnatav yam avashishyate. So again, notice this is in the same meter. Jnanam te ham savig jnanam eight. Idam vakshamya sheshata. You don't count the visarga as um, one of the syllables. Yaj gnyatva neha buyo nyaj gnyatav yam avashishyate. So each one has eight syllables. Um, so it's basically, I will tell you, vakshami, I'm going to tell you of knowledge, gnyanam and sevignyanam. Um, knowledge is like sort of book knowledge, sevignyanam is really more like realized knowledge. Yet, you know, having known this, um, one basically may um, come to know everything with, one may know everything there is to know of a shishite without remainder. Um, so there's nothing other than this. Um, so again, we'll look at it in a few translations by the same people. Um, so again, first we have Winthrop Sargent. Um, so he says, to you I shall explain in full this knowledge, again, knowledge, jnana, along with realization, big jnana, which having been understood, nothing further remains to be known here in this world, in the world. Um, and then our next one, Graham Schweig says, I shall explain this knowledge to you along with realized knowledge, with nothing left unsaid, knowing which in nothing further in this world is left to be known. And then Nick Sutton, again, his is sort of more just, he doesn't really use verse form, it's just sentences. Um, I shall explain to you in full both the Gnana and the Vignana. Notice he doesn't translate them. He decides, you know what, I can't encapsulate this in English. So sometimes, translators make this choice, which is why it's helpful to learn a bit of Sanskrit yourself so that you can sort of learn what these words mean. And then he says, when this is understood, there is nothing else remaining that should be known. Um, Barbara Stoller Miller says, I will teach you the totality of knowledge and judgment. So notice she's translated vijnana, which everybody up until now has sort of said is like embodied or realized knowledge as judgment. That's a very different choice. If you were just reading her translation, you might have a very different sense of what that word means. Um, and then she says, this known, nothing else in the world need to be known. Um, you might get a sense of why I'm choosing to do this as our last verse, because after this, there won't be anything else. Um, 
So just a couple more translations of it. Lori Patton, um, I will explain this knowledge to you in its fullness, as well as the means of discerning it. So she translates vijnana as the means of understanding it, basically, discerning it. Once it is known, nothing is left to be known here on earth. Um, and then our last one in this sort of archaic English, um, theoretical knowledge to thee, along with practical, I shall now expound completely. Having known which in this world, no other further thing to be known is left. So, you know, we can maybe just stop there and there's nothing else to learn if we've um, learned it all, although we haven't read the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita. So maybe we've, um, maybe we've missed that. He also says, yes, but I'm now going to tell you. So I guess we haven't read that yet either. Um, so I, as I said, I just, I really wanted to give you a sense of the different varieties um, of translation and the things that you might miss if you just pick up a translation without having at least some relationship to the Sanskrit words and to the idea that every Sanskrit word has a lot of potential meanings. Um, Wendy Doniger, who's um, written a bunch of books, she's a Sanskritist in, at um, the University of Chicago, she makes some joke that every Sanskrit word means itself, its opposite, um, the name of a god. I think she's got a few others in there, something about a cow, a sexual position. Um, you know, every word has a lot of different meanings. Um, and so it's helped the more you start to be familiar with at least this idea and sort of learn how to look at words, you will have a different relationship to the text, even if you don't study, um, even if you don't spend years studying Sanskrit, you can have an idea of both how to pronounce the words um, and also how to kind of, how to think about them in context and how to think about translation. Um, does anybody have any questions? We don't have uh, any questions in the chat box, but we could uh, wait a few minutes and see if anyone has anything. Yeah, let's, um, so if anybody has any questions, um, I'm gonna keep talking for a couple minutes, but if you do, please ask. It can be about anything. I know I talked about a lot of different things. Um, again, I just wanna give you a, I just really wanna give you a sense of why it might be fun to study Sanskrit. Um, because I also think it's fun. All of my students who study, one of the first things they sort of, um, they say is learning to write the alphabet is actually fun. You know, you start in the first class, we will write out the alphabet and it gives you the feeling of, of like being a five-year-old again, you know, of getting to draw the shapes, of getting to write the letters, of getting to pronounce new sounds. And that does something really different to your brain. It makes you, it makes you think differently. It makes you engage differently. Um, thank you guys who are chatting. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I wish I could see all of you in one room. <laughs> that would be fun. Um, but I, I'm imagining. Um, and yeah, so you learning to write, learning to hear the sounds, learning to say the sounds, learning to engage with the different words, learning to identify words that you see as words that you actually know, and then the different things that that may do to your brain um, because it makes you sort of think differently. Um, again, if anybody has any questions, please do ask. Um, as I said, this is my book. We will be learning from it, Yoga Vitaranam, the translation of yoga. Um, you will need to get my book if you take the course because we will be learning from it. You can get it on Amazon. Um, Make sure you, I think it's what's up there, but if you get it, make sure you get the, the first edition. Um, and um, the first, because there's a new Indian edition, don't get that. It's um, the paper quality isn't as good and it's not in color and you want it in color, it's more fun. Um, 
And sorry, just looking to see if anybody has a question, but thank you all. Um, you'll hopefully, yeah, you might have more questions when we get more to the, um, to the specifics. Um, so that's my book. I will make my pictures go away. Um, yes, sorry. I, I know somebody asked me to do that earlier, but it's, um, I'm new to the slides. I will learn how to go back and forth between them more easily um, next time. Um, any, anybody else have any, any questions, any burning thoughts, any, um, don't be shy. <laughs> um, well, I guess then, if nobody has any questions, I will, um, say thank you. <laughs> thank you all for joining me. And I hope that you will um, join me in September. And oh, I know I want to, uh, to, um, to answer the question that somebody asked before. Um, yeah, if you have studied some Sanskrit before, um, I do still recommend getting my book. Um, it, is, it does go from the very beginning, but it is also comprehensive. Um, and it's comprehensive to the, I would say, pretty much everything you need to know by the end you're reading, um, Upanishads and, um, yeah. I do teach other online courses, other places, which you can find on my website, um, which are at a more advanced level, um, for the person who was asking that before. Um, but I would generally recommend, even if you've done some Sanskrit, if you're rusty, starting at the beginning. My method is a bit different to other methods, so you may find that even if you've done some before, um, you might find it helpful to start again. Um, so yes, yeah, somebody's asking about how the course will work. So basically, we will do this. Um, I will sit in my living room and talk to you. Um, and yes, my, my method, I would say, is unique in that I, I want you reading texts as soon as possible. So most textbooks, if you've studied some Sanskrit before, you'll learn, you know, you'll read a little bit and you'll read all these made up sentences like, Ramo Vanam Gachati, Rama goes to the forest. There's all kinds of, you know, it's like see, spot, run. All of these things that are completely irrelevant to things, to texts that you actually might like to read. So my method is that right from, like, right from day one, right from our first class, we're gonna be reading real words. And then as soon as possible, we're gonna be reading little sutras. At the beginning, we won't be, we'll talk about the meaning, but you won't know the grammar yet, obviously. We're gonna first focus on learning how to read the Devanagari script. Um, so first we'll learn the alphabet and then we'll learn how to combine vowels. We'll learn how to combine consonants. So we will learn to read fluently. Um, and then we'll start to learn some grammar. Um, and as we do it, I will, as I said, right from the beginning, you will be reading real text. And that I think to me is the value, you know, that's, that's why that's why I presume that you want to study. You don't want to read made up words. As I said, you might want to read road signs in India, but that's sort of a side benefit. Really, you probably want to pick up a text and at least be able to read the sounds and then ultimately to engage with the sounds and to learn some meaning. Um, so each class I will um, talk a bit. Um, I mean, a little whiteboard so I can write on it so you can see me writing as well as slides. Um, the first class, we will start with the alphabet. We will do a bit together in subsequent classes. Um, so each class, I'll give you homework. So then in the other classes, we'll begin by reviewing the homework. I will answer your questions. Um, and I'm gonna, because we're only going to meet once a month, I'm going to give you one homework assignment basically for about each week. Um, and then we're going to have a Facebook group. Um, and in the Facebook group, I will um, 
post the answers to um, the homework. I will also, if you have any questions, I can answer them in the Facebook group. Um, but in the actual lesson itself, we will work a lot on pronunciation. So even though I can't see you, I'm going to do what I did today, which is I will say something and I will have you hopefully talk back to me and repeat it, even if I can't hear you. Um, I'm also going to have you sit and write. So we'll take little pauses while um, I'm teaching in the other classes. So, you know, I'll talk a bit and then I'll have you sit and write and then I'll talk a bit and I'll have you sit and write so that you actually get, you will, it'll be more, um, what we were just talking about, the vignana, the, the practical knowledge as well as the jnana, as well as the theoretical knowledge. Um, so yeah, hopefully that gives you an idea of, um, of me and what we will do. Um, I think it'll be lots of fun. I hope you will join me. Um, and thank you all for joining me today. Um, and namaste. <laughs> about you. <laughs> oh,